Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Center for Child Protection's Critical Conversations in Child Protection webinar series. This is our first webinar, so really excited to be doing this with you guys today. It's our inaugural, I should say, Critical Conversations webinar. Now, the objective of this series is to facilitate learning from the latest research, from practice knowledge, theory, lived experiences around safeguarding children and young people and so on. It's for a multi-professional group of child protection professionals. That includes health, it includes education, police, social work, third sector organizations and more. This is all of you. Now, I'm the head of the Centre for Child Protection and my name's Tracy Green. And the Center for Child Protection really aims to get to the heart of child protection training using innovative ideas. As can be seen in our multi award winning public engagement, impact and research portfolio. We offer CPD certified training using interactive and engaging child protection simulations, and we deliver a postgraduate program in advanced child protection, including a master's. Uh, postgraduate diploma, certificate, and some standalone modules, which are all for multidisciplinary child protection professionals and are all available through distance learning. Now, we are currently celebrating our 10 year anniversary through a series of events, including this webinar series, which is Critical Conversations. And we have plans to continue this into the next year and beyond, depending on feedback and how things go over these next couple of months. We also have a live celebration in Canterbury on the 9th of November with the keynote speaker, Professor Eileen Monroe, which we're very excited about. Places are limited, so if you are interested, you need to book quickly onto that. Um, and finally, we have our inaugural collaboration award. And this award we're going to be giving to somebody who, um, in order to celebrate their outstanding multi-agency child protection working. It comes with the 500 monetary award with it as well. The nominations need to be in by the 3rd of October, um, and we will put some links into the chat for you to learn more about all of these things, the live event, additional critical conversation webinars, as well as this award. Now, before I introduce the main event, just a couple of little housekeeping notes. Please note that we are recording this session for a time limited public distribution, so this will out, go out publicly. Your videos and microphones, uh, I think actually, yeah, your videos and your microphones are disabled for a few reasons. Briefly, this is just to ensure a smooth, easy to hear GDPR sensitive experience for all of you. The chat feature is enabled, and this is to encourage discussion, questions and networking. However, I do want to make just a few quick notes about the chat. First, chat isn't recorded, so chat away. That won't be uh, distributed publicly. We do ask that you please use chat responsibly and respectfully of others. Also, the presenter, who is uh, Dr. Alice Loving today, won't be able to read and respond to the chat. However, we have chat monitors who will answer non-specialist questions, and they will be able to pull out questions that will be read back to the presenter to answer in the last 10 to 15 minutes of this session so that they can answer those questions for you. We will try to get to all of the questions, but we may run out of time as well. If there's something urgent and we haven't been able to get to it, uh, you can contact us separately, please. And finally, please join us on social media. You can tweet about the event by following hashtag CCP is 10, and that's T-E-N versus the number or you can do hashtag critical conversations all as one word. And I'll put those hashtags in the chat in a minute. And now what I would say for now, without any further ado, I think it's ready for our primary event. So I wanna introduce you to Dr. Alice Loving, who is a lecturer for the Center for Child Protection, and she delivers attachment and relationship-based practice training to social care practitioners. She's going to talk with you today about some of her PhD findings specifically on relationship dynamics between parents and social workers from a parent's perspective. So Alice, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Okay, thanks Tracy. I'm just gonna pop up my slides. Okay. Okay, is that all good with the 
the view and the slides. Perfect. Okay, oh. thank you. Okay, well, I'm really pleased to be with everybody this morning. Thank you for joining this call. Um, this is going to be a really great series, um, and I feel privileged to be the one kind of kicking it off. So, without further ado, this is going to be about a 40 minute uh, lecture um, talking about some of my findings on a very specific part of my research, but I wanted to kind of introduce you at the start to what the, the give a bit of context to what the research project was um, actually focusing on. Um, but the main area that I want to focus on this morning is drawing out some of the themes that came from talking to parents um, about their relationship with their child's social worker. Um, so I've drawn out those themes and I think before we get stuck in, I just really want to be clear and sort of clarify that this presentation isn't about um, you know, finding fault with social, the way that the social workers were interacting or practicing with these parents. It's not about finding fault with the parents either. It's much more about um, really drawing our attention and our focus to how complex this relationship really is um, and the dynamics that, that pre naturally present itself you know, in, in most cases. And I think having that awareness and that understanding of the complexities and these dynamics beneath the surface um, is really key to that relationship and obviously the much bigger picture being um, that, that that relation, the aim of that relationship is to gain a, a better understanding of what's going on for the child. So um, a little bit of context, first of all, what actually was this research project before I zoom in into thinking about um, just that one part, which was the, the relationship with their child's social worker. So my overall research question was what factors affect the parental experience and outcomes of parent infant intervention? And by that, I meant when um, the intervention was um, that local authority had become involved with um, the majority of these parents had very young babies. Um, and so that was the intervention process that they were on child protection, um, child protection plans. And um, there were kind of three different um, options of intervention that happened for these families. One was to go into a residential assessment unit. One was to go into um, uh, foster placement with their child um, and the other one was having parent infant psychotherapy. So of all the parents that I spoke to, they were each one of the, they were in each of those categories. So I had 17 participants, five dads and 12 mums. I was absolutely um, over the moon to get five dads because when you dig more deeper into the research in social work, it's quite... Um, it's less likely and it's more difficult often to, to get dads to, um, to to be engaged in some of this research. So I was really, really pleased about that. So two of the, the, the parents that I worked with were having parent infant psychotherapy. One was having parent infant psychotherapy plus being in a foster placement. Um, and the other one was, um, though the other five were in foster placements and nine were in residential units. So what I was essentially wanting to look at with that research question is what were the things that were the factors or the, the, the areas that were positive and helpful that might have meant that those participants that had a positive outcome and returned to the community with their with their children, what was it about their situation, that intervention that might have given them more of an opportunity for that to have that successful outcome? Equally, those that had their children removed, from their care because I followed them throughout the entire period of the proceedings. It was about a six month period. What was it for them? What factors might have been present for them in terms of their relationships, in terms of the intervention process, in terms of their relationship with their child that might well have contributed um, to them having an unsuccessful outcome and therefore having their child removed from their care? Um, I'll kind of breeze through this bit because I said, as I said, I'm not getting into the the depth of my my total findings. I want to move to zooming into that section on relationships. But essentially, this was the participant criteria that I was looking for. 
Uh, recruitment was my biggest challenge. It took a long, a long time to get those 17, but I was really proud that I did get them in the end. Obviously, it's it's a complex, stressful time for parents. Um, and it wasn't surprising that Kate taking part in a PhD research study was not probably the top of their priority list. Um, again, going to breeze through this bit, but my design was qualitative. So I had three um, interviews with them over that period of six months, which took me to the end of knowing what was going to be the outcome for this family. Um, and at the fir first interview and the last interview, I had discussions with them about their relationship with their child social worker. So I wanted to draw out from them a better understanding of what that relationship looked like, you know, what were the positives, what were the negatives, and I revisited that at the end as well. Um, so all my interviews were, were recorded and then transcribed. So what I've included in this presentation is a few snippets of um, extracts of conversations where parents did speak about their relationship with their um, child social worker so you can get a real feel for the depth of what that theme really um, meant. Um, again, going to whiz through this, but at, for my analysis, I used thematic analysis. So that meant that I had to re, you know, read all of those transcripts of those interviews and start to identify if there are any common codes or themes. Uh, because by the end of that process, I knew who had been successful, successful and who hadn't. So that started to generate factors for me about um, what, whether there were, were there were similarities for those people that had a positive or a negative outcome. And lucky for me, there was a really clear cut difference. There were really clear themes that were coming out for those parents that had returned to the community and for those parents who um, had um, had sadly been unsuccessful and had their children removed. So I'm not going to get into each of these. That's a separate webinar. I've done that before. If there was demand, I'd do it again. Um, but this essentially what, what I then had was um, was all of the, the themes or the factors that were associated with those people that had a positive outcome. So that's this left hand side column. And I termed those change facilitators because I really believed that where these things are present, it gave someone a much better opportunity um, to, to, to have to, to be successful and remain with their child. Equally, for on the, the, the column on the right hand side were the clear um, factors that were present for those parents that had had um, a um, negative outcome and had their child removed. So I termed these change inhibitors. So these were the things that I believed and the research supported um, had contributed to their struggles and their difficulties um, to remain with their child. Bigger picture being, well, let's make sure with our intervention that we're doing as much as we can to bring about these change facilitators and working in a way um, to enable that. And equally, our intervention should be targeting those inhibitors, should be focused on thinking about how we can remove those and work on those and improve those. So that's the bigger picture um, of this piece of research. Um, but as I said, my first and my third interview um, looked specifically at wanting to talk to parents about their relationship with their child's social worker because I thought could this be one of the factors you know if they've had a difficult relationship could that lead to um, be an influence on the on the bigger outcome so um, a couple of themes key themes that came up um, and I'm going to go through some of these I'm going to go through with a little bit of um, the research um, the main ones with a little bit of research to support that as well to show that it, what this isn't just my finding actually there were other researchers who were finding similar things um so the first one relates to misinterpretation and i'll say more about each of these in detail as i go through um the next one was confusion over um the the actual role of the social worker what is their responsibility what are they there to do what can't they do um a lack of transparency, um, feeling as if the social worker had quite a tunneled vision view, so wasn't necessarily always taking into account you know, how they were seeing things, how they were feeling about things. Um, 
an idea of perfect parent fallacy. So the social worker, again, kind of bringing to the relationship this sense of um, having such an extremely high standard that actually most parents might at some point fail to, to meet. Um, um, a lack of empathy. So feeling as if you know, the, the, the social worker um, didn't kind of have that understanding again of of things that they were um, they were going through and their kind of thoughts and acknowledging their thoughts, their feelings. And lastly, an element of um, the, 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 the relationship in itself by the nature of what it is being quite triggering and bringing about sort of trauma related symptoms. So also at the start and the end of this, my interview process, I um, did something called a trauma symptom checklist. Um, so I wanted to see what kind of symptoms were were present for them. And not surprisingly, um, a huge amount of participants had quite a lot of symptoms that are associated with previous trauma. Something important to add here, two things actually. One is part of my criteria for my participants was that they had had attachment based trauma. So by that, I mean they'd experienced significant incidences of abuse or neglect in their own childhood. Now, not surprisingly, it wasn't difficult for that to be part of the criteria. I would say that maybe about 95 percent of the families that we work with um, within child protection have um, have some sort of history of, of this themselves. So I think when looking at all of these themes, and I'm going to draw some of that out in a minute, it's very clear that um, there's an element of trauma, that, the, that their own element of trauma is what often is um, causing many of these dynamics to exist within the relationship. And that will become clearer as I kind of go through each of them. But we, we, we can't kind of discount that as having quite a con considerable impact on that relationship. So misinterpretation. So this was a theme that came out whereby um, I felt, uh, based on, on the accounts that they were giving, that potentially um, some, some of the things that the parents were talking about, they had misinterpreted the social worker's behaviour or expression or body language. So a couple of examples of this. Um, I said, I said, what if he goes for adoption? Will I ever see him again? And she went, no, I just bawled out and cried because I'm a sensitive person. And she looked at me and smiled. She could have said, are you OK? She saw me crying and she smiled. So I obviously wasn't there in that room when this happened for this parent. But my potential interpretation of it is that she was perhaps her facial expression was one of trying to kind of comfort, a comforting kind of gentle, soft, holding kind of smile. But that was, you know, misinterpreted as if she was, um, you know, potentially kind of laughing and, and just not being sensitive towards her. Um, another participant said, talking about the social worker, she went to court, got the order and came out smiling. And then we're in court and she tried to speak to me and I went to jump up and the barrister said, no, 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 you need to stay calm for this. It's upsetting because they were laughing. Now, I find it very hard to to think that that situation happened exactly as that parent has described, that, 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 that a social worker would be um, laughing and smiling. I mean, it, it might be that they might have smiled at some point during that process, just in a kind of natural engagement, maybe with the people that they're around. But I think it just highlights how much in that scenario you're kind of on watch and, and, and on show. Um, and uh, and again, sort of the potential for misinterpreting any kind of positivity as um, a kind of negative persecutory act towards you. Now, when we tap into a little bit about how attachment trauma can influence people's interpretation of things like body language and um, facial expression based on how they see themselves. So if someone has a view of themselves, at themselves as very negative, they are likely to um, perceive other people to also view themselves in that way. You know, I can't get into this now, but our internal working model of how we see ourselves 
is so key to um, you know, our behaviour and especially our relationships. So um, what's, the, what's the research saying that just gives us a little bit of understanding around, um, around why this might happen in these relationships where there's attachment based trauma history and we're trying to form a relationship with, um, with a parent. So the neuroscientific findings suggest that children have been abused may interpret quite neutral behaviours um, as hostile. And the mirror neuron system learns from experience. So where um, with relational trauma victims, it's likely that they interpret um, an intention behind an action. Always there's something more. There's an intent behind it. So a, a brilliant example that Dan Siegel gives is that in an ordinary setting, if somebody raises their hand, um, you know, if I'd never experienced any sense of relational or attachment based trauma, I might interpret that hand as they're waving to say hello or they're flagging a cab. But if um, if if that's not the case and I, I, I do have this sense of kind of unresolved attachment trauma, I might misinterpret that as actually I'm going to be struck. I'm going to be hit because what comes with this trauma is a kind of constant vigilance of whether things are safe or unsafe so rather than being able to be responsive to what's actually happening in the moment my brain switches to becoming reactive much much more quickly um, so that that reaction is a kind of primitive reaction response of freeze flight fight so it's another reason why um, We'll talk more about this a little bit later on, but why the dynamic in that relationship could trigger that fight mechanism, that sense of threat. I feel threatened by you. I feel you're a threat to my family. And that might trigger that more aggressive fight response very, very quickly. Um, if, if, again, this person has this kind of unresolved attachment based trauma um, that, that's causing that dynamic to come into the relationship more frequently. Um, so the next one I mentioned was about confusion over role. So um, some participants appeared to have expectations of their child's social worker that possibly centred on their own needs. Um, and that might well relate to what we um, often talk about as a, as a concept of having an inner child. And for some parents, again, who have a kind of um, relatively extreme attachment trauma history, someone coming in to, they might not necessarily view you as a threat. And this also depends on personality type and attachment style. Um, they might not view you as a threat. They might view you as someone who is trying to support, someone who is trying to help. And they kind of have this inner need and desire to connect and be nurtured. And, um, and therefore they can misinterpret whether you know either what what your role is here in terms of um, being there for them, being there for their child, and I don't think it's as clear cut as just being able to say, "Well, I am your child's social worker," because actually, you do need to offer a degree of support and help and empathy towards that parent, because that's the only way you can firstly know what's going on for the child, but also have a potential in less extreme cases to intervene positively. Um, and, and provide new positive changes. So it's not clear cut as I think being very boundary and saying I am just here for your child. But I think your actions need to be kind of clear about what that what that looks like, what the help and support with them looks like and what it looks like for the child. So having this expectation that you're here for me seemed to generate um, quite negative feelings if those expectations weren't met. So, for example, she's going against us and says, step up or you're going to lose the kids in a few weeks. So she's not on our side. So we feel like she's just listening to everyone else and not us. A different example. Sometimes I say to them, show me what you can do then. Let's see if you're genuinely going to help me or not. Um, or you're not going to do anything at all. Just because or just cause more headache for me in the long run. And that is what did actually happen. Even though we're coming up to the 29th of this month, my property still hasn't benefited from me having a social worker. So 
so this dad was adamant that he felt part of his part of this social worker's role was to help him with um you know the specifics of his housing which i know we do have connections to that network um but again you know managing that expectation of what is possible um um is, is it was clearly important because this had caused him to have quite negative feelings um because of it so um the next one lack of transparency so a common theme to emerge was parents feelings if they were not communicated with openly and honestly and i think this is a really really important one sometimes in my teaching i kind of tap into how our own attachment pattern may well influence how um how well we deliver some of these messages how 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 well we deliver quite hard to hear um, messages and and why we potentially might be a bit avoidant at times to do that so i think that came through in some of the interactions that participants were talking about um, because in reality that seemed to cause more frustration in the long run you know, there might be a sense of i, I want to try to protect this relationship so i'm not going to maybe say everything or i'm going to leave it to, to discuss this in a meeting you know, maybe that's because of safety reasons or whatever it might be but but that feeling a lack of transparency seemed to create this growing dislike that in most cases i feel like if there's transparency from the beginning and the expectations are set from the beginning um that had a more kind of positive income even though that did mean saying things that were going to be difficult to hear potentially upsetting but i think setting that boundary from the beginning in a still doing it in a kind of supportive nurturing way was really really important um so it appeared that when this was occurring it might have contributed to a breakdown in the relationship which generated a distrust and i think as soon as you have a distrust present it's quite hard to get that back and that distrust then impacts on engagement and receptivity um and yeah in many cases once that distrust set in it it didn't um there it did the relationship didn't recover so the traumatized brain someone who has as i said had this attachment based trauma is kind of hard uh, the hard wiring is present but it's often been traumatized so the software is is often programmed to be fearful and distrusting so again, you know, you, you, you're potentially coming into a situation with someone who already at the start has a sense of being kind of fearful and distrusting of others. So getting this right from the beginning is, is so, so important. Um, just some examples of this. So she can be all right to your face, but then she goes to someone else and slags us off. Like at our family conference, it was really good. Apparently it was all positive. She agreed to do it and then she came She's come here and she basically said to the manager of this place that the family conference went crap, but she said to our face that it went good and was really happy. Um, I kicked off a bit and said, if you had a problem with me being in there in the first place, why didn't you take me away before the three months? But they said, we haven't got no concerns about you, but then in court they did. They really were contradicting themselves horrible i had no relationship with her she wouldn't tell me nothing she held information back from me she had um, a double standard sort of approach to things she would say one thing to me and then say something to somebody else he walked into the hospital on the discharge planning meeting and he wasn't going to let me home and that was the first time i'd been told that apparently i'd said some really disturbing things and i was like what are you talking about i have no idea what you're talking about like talk to me um so all of those are very different individual cases there's going to be other things going on but there is this clear sense of not feeling like there's a transparency and honesty and openness okay tunnel vision so um this one was that some participants were reporting a feeling that when disagreements did occur there was a kind of tunnel vision approach so disagreements between with between them so between them and their child's social worker but there was a tunnel vision approach whereby they did not feel listened to or understood and i think regardless of whether you agree with what that parent is saying we can all give the space and the time 
for someone to feel like they're being listened to um, and that their their perspective is at least understood why they what you don't have to agree with it but they can understand why they might be feeling that way um, this may then have impacted on their engagement with the requests being made by the social worker. So this kind of links into a concept that, again, I don't have too much time to go into detail about now, but something that's used quite a lot within the psychology world and therapeutic world, which is this idea of epistemic trust. This idea of needing to feel like your the, the client, the client needs to feel like you understand what it's like to be them. You have to agree with what their perception is, but you understand how they've got to a position in their mind based on whatever it might be, the immediate interaction, their past. You understand what it's like to be them because if they don't get that sense from you, they might hear what you're saying, but they're not actually listening. So again, in terms of engagement, it's essential that we do get to a place that um, you know, parents are able to listen to what we're saying. But the reality is that by the nature of the psychology behind this, they will not be listening. They might hear, but they're not really taking it in and listening and processing if they don't feel like you're coming to this with a, with a desire to understand them, with, with actually genuinely understanding them. So that's a really, really important part of the relationship. So an, an example here, a social worker should have their opinion, but also take on board the opinion of the person they are working with. Whereas in her position, she is right. Her opinion is what matters. She is the one who says what happens and the other person does not matter. The man has based his opinion of me by what the midwives had said. He should have come to me and introduced himself, got a little bit of a first impression. So that's based off a, a, off a mum whose experience was she'd had quite a hallucinative episode, which was most likely down to um, the drugs that she'd had during labour. But also there was a history there with her previous child having been um, cared for by her mum due to mental health difficulties. Um, so they, they'd kind of made a decision that she would need um, you know, child protection intervention upon leaving the hospital. Um, but I think this this mum just felt um, that she didn't disagree with the decision, but she felt like it, this she was hearing what this man's plan was and what his thoughts were at the discharge planning meeting, rather than him actually speaking to the midwife, speaking to her, coming to the meeting. And that might have been a time thing. Who knows? You know, I'm I'm not I'm not gonna stand here and think that we have this idealistic system where it's possible to to do all of this all of the time um but but that's that's kind of the the backstory to that um so in terms of thinking about that theme tunnel vision so similar findings from other researchers um who noted that in some cases parents felt that practitioner, practitioners had a very narrow had narrow preconceived ideas about the problems that were present so I often talk in my teaching about, um, you know, seeing each case individually, not just basing things purely on what's written and the past, but, you know, seeing seeing each each client as an individual and a new start in their relationship with you. Um, not feeling listened to also features within other studies. Um, Forrester's work noted low level, levels of listening from um, social workers. Um, and there's a paper by Ross that I've included in a link below this. Um, below uh, this webinar, which you can read, um, which is titled Talking to a Paper where they talked to families whose children were actually placed into care. And the title of the whole paper is No Voice, No Opinion, Nothing, indicating some similar feelings there. Okay, so <clears throat> the last couple to talk about is um, this perfect parent fallacy. Um, so some parents felt that social workers expected a standard of care, standard of care that they should be providing, um, which exceeded that which they felt an average parent is achieving. Now, I found this a really interesting one because I think I'd also experienced this in my own practice from working in local authorities and working in um, residential mother and baby unit setting, where sometimes I think when you're in a position of intervention and change, you can sometimes get, I think, as a professional, a bit caught up in, in the expectation. Um, and 
I saw it in the unit that I worked in where, you know, we'd have a team meeting and I'd come away with about 20 things written down that we'd be wanting this month to work on. Now, some of those I was very aware would be happening with the average parent at times and they weren't necessarily linked to risk or concern. <clears throat> so, for example, some some things that might be kind of listed as things I need to action or change immediately might be something to do with um, you know, the child's diet. And it might be that they're not being fed the healthiest of food. But is that di that's different to they're not being fed. You know, a lot of parents might not be giving their kids the healthiest of foods, but we're not removing those children. Um, equally, things like a dummy. You know, I've seen written down on the child and need plan about the need to remove this dummy. Now, that child didn't have any speech problems. It was just, you know, long term, of course, dummies are, are not good. And we do know that and there needs to be some sort of cut off. But, you know, two to three year old who's using it for comfort. I know hundreds of parents that do that. So they're just a couple of examples. But um, but really, it's I think when we when we have too many things that we're bringing to a parent of, that need to be changed, the danger is that we end up overwhelming them to the point where they don't really hear any of them it's all just this big long list and we what we've lost in that is an ability to really focus on the things that are to do with risk the things that we know that they need to action you know imminently that can get lost in this perfect parent fallacy so an example of what parents said about this i put my daughter on the floor facing that way because like I said to them, the only reason that I put her on the floor is so she can go and play with her toys. And they said, that's not interacting with your baby. And I said, but when you're here, I have to talk to you. My daughter is playing with the toys and obviously I am watching her. When you go to a parenting course, you're told there's no such thing as a perfect parent. But when it comes to social services, their ideals of what a perfect parent is. If you're not that, then they want to take your child away. So you send us on parenting courses, they teach us there's no such thing as a perfect parent, but you guys want that from people. You want them to be perfect parents and anything less than that, then you make their lives hell. So I think that's a really good example that somewhere in there, that, that parent has lost a sense of what actually is the risk and concern, which clearly there is. But I don't think that's completely down to denial or a defence mechanism. I think that's just this whole big concept of expectation and those key worries that have been lost in that process. OK, so the last few and then we will um, hopefully have a little bit of time for some questions. So a lack of empathy. Um, there was a this was sadly quite a prominent theme and whether again that was more this is how things would be interpret were being interpreted. I'm not sure, but sadly what I could find um, from the research um, from academics like Forrester was that he was also finding similar things. Um, so that made me think that this wasn't necessarily a misinterpretation, but this was maybe a, a genuine theme that that was present. So the parents felt that their thoughts, their feelings, their struggles, their difficulties were just not considered in, in that process. Um, with my social worker, I know that she has a daughter, so I say put yourself in my shoes and imagine if it was your daughter. Imagine what I'm saying to you about your daughter. How would you feel? And she will say, you're not allowed to talk about my daughter. And I'm saying, well, put yourself in my shoes and understand where I'm coming from. Before you tell me something, understand that you're that yourself in my shoes, understand every little point that I'm coming from and then say something to me. So she's screaming for a sense of this social worker being able to not necessarily agree with things she's doing, but understand how she might be feeling. Um, she's done things unprofessionally where she would ask me to leave the room, but she would have someone that had nothing to do with the case be in the room. <clears throat> and it's like, how dare you have that person in the room talking about me and my child and I'm not allowed to know um, nothing that is going on. So again, that that I don't know this 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 specific scenario around that, but we can understand how that might feel, you know, if that even happened to us, <clears throat> that we know people were talking about us in a room that we're not allowed to be present in. That's quite a difficult um, situation to sit with and be comfortable with. 
So maybe there just needed to be more explanation of why that was actually happening if, you know, if there was um, clear reasons for it. Um, so other, other researchers that have found similarities with this, Dale's um, parents that he spoke to said that they wanted social workers to appear more human, you know, that sense of understanding them. Um, Whiffin states how important empathic communication can be and an awareness for how it feels to be on the receiving end of the child protection system. I think understandably, and this is very important with resistant families, understandably that can get lost in amongst the absolute chaos and overwhelm of doing this job day to day and the system. I think it is very easy for that moment of reflection and contemplation about how it feels to be on the receiving end to get absolutely lost and there's certainly a place for that within um, supervision. Um, <clears throat> so Forrester has highlighted the challenge that social workers may face in knowing how to actually show empathy without colluding with the concerning behaviour and that's a really good point. Achieving this is actually again quite complex um, so fourth advises practitioners of the need to be empathic, but with an eyes wide open, boundaried, authoritative approach. So it's about getting a balance. That's what I mean. It's, it, it's not clear cut and it is complex. Forrester's work showed those who demonstrated empathy encountered less resistance and obtained more information directly from clients. So it, it serves us positively to do this. We, we will be better at our um, better at our job by bringing this level of um, of empathy, and we will lower resistance in that process. Behaving in an empathic way did not impact on their ability to identify concerns and discuss those with parents. So it doesn't it, that that's the perfect balance to be had. But I'm, I'm by no means standing here and saying that that's easy to achieve. But that's essentially how it would how it would look. And <clears throat> as I said before, the importance of this sense of epistemic trust, having somebody feel like you understand what it's like to be them, otherwise you'll get nowhere in that relationship of them listening to the things that we really need them to listen to, you know, the concerns, the worries, the risks. Um, Mentalisation, haven't got time to go into that now because I've got about five more minutes and then we'll go into questions, but um, obviously, this process, again, it very much links with empathy, This the ability to think about what was in someone's mind, what are they thinking and feeling, and therefore we can understand their behaviour much better. We can respond in the right way, in an appropriate, attuned, sensitive way, just as we, we do in the context of talking about wanting parents to do that who mentalise. Well, as practitioners, we need to be mentalising for the child to help the parent to see what's in the child's mind, but we also need to be mentalising for the practitioners. Um, for the parents, sorry. So, um, but our ability to do this, you know, to offer empathy, to be considerate about what's in people's minds, is massively compromised by um, our own level of stress and tiredness and burnout. Now, I don't know any any um, practitioner currently working in frontline social care who's not frequently experiencing periods of stress and overwhelm and burnout. So it's not surprising to me that that, that, is, that is being compromised in our relationships with parents. And like I said before, the system, it doesn't lend itself to being able to do some of these things particularly easily. Okay, so the last one is um, this sense of the relationship having an underlying kind of trauma inducing factor for uh, some parents. So they reported trauma symptoms that were directly connected to the relationship with the social worker. So uh, the night before the social, they know the social worker's coming, not sleeping. Um, the morning that they know they're coming, not eating. As soon as they hear their car, that starts to trigger, you know, a kind of autonomic arousal and they can feel their heart racing. At that point, obviously, they might have an increase in adrenaline and already all of those things have set that parent up into not necessarily a very receptive way of engaging. And I think that might be why for some people, the moment they walk in, they're sensing a kind of um, well, basically that kind of sort of fight response from the beginning, because that is what their body is actually um, doing beneath the surface. So again, 
it's so, so complex. Um, and it's not just seeing someone as being difficult and aggressive, it's understanding where and why that comes from. Um, this is not surprising given the potential fear and anxiety felt within that relationship as well. You know, the fear of what this person is going to do, or taking their child, um, you know, reporting them for whatever or what else might be going on in their life. You know, there's, there's, it's understandable that fear and anxiety would be present. Um, and this might link to previous feelings, again, with those with attachment based trauma of what we call fear without solution. So Mary Main has used this term to talk about um, children who are being abused by the person who is supposed to be offering them comfort and protection, that that creates a sense of fear because they are fearful of the harm that person is inflicting on them. But they have no solution. They have no control over what's happening um, because that that person is supposed to be their caregiver. So I kind of delved a little bit deeper into this with my research and I felt like that fear without solution could also be present as an adult when you're having to engage with a social worker because you are fearful of what's going to happen. You also feel very much like it's all out of your control. And unless it's an extreme case, I think it's really important for that message to get across to the parent that actually you 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 do have the ability um, to, to control which way this goes. It is in your hands rather than being in someone else's. What you choose to do next, how you choose to engage, what changes you choose to make, it's all on you. You are actually in control here. So um, I think we need to try and yeah dispel that sense of not, not being in control of the solution. And that might minimise some of that fear which is what we need to do to, to, to engage in a more positive relationship. Um, the relational trauma triggers um, could, could cause the emergence of worse self behaviour. So I definitely noticed that when there's a good relationship with the, the social worker, they're able to be their best version of their best self. When that relationship wasn't positive, it almost brings out their absolute worst behaviour, some, some inner child sort of behaviour, you know, being difficult, being defiant, being potentially aggressive. And these these parents weren't like that all the time with everybody else. But again, the dynamic of that relationship could trigger that emergence of, of worse self, which obviously didn't, um, didn't benefit them in any way. Um, so a little bit, a few examples of this, I feel like uh, when I've not seeing my social worker for a few days I feel happy and I know that I feel okay and then when I see her I think you know what I don't want to see this right lady right now because it really stresses me out. I'm not going to go through all of these because I want to make sure we do some questions but there's just a couple of examples there and you guys can read those um, in your own time. So very lastly if I just can take one more minute did these negative relational dynamics appear to influence the outcome of the intervention? So did I find if they had a good relationship, they had a successful outcome. If they had a negative relationship, that impacted negatively on the outcome. Surprisingly not. So aside from one participant, all of the participants reported a negative relationship with their child's social worker, including those who had a positive outcome. Why? Um, perhaps the presence of those change facilitators in this group kind of buffered the impact that that negative relationship had on the outcome, but it still was present for them that it wasn't a positive experience. Um, that is, of course, not to minimise the importance of having that positive working relationship. You know, those, those people were successful because they had other things going on for them. Um, so, yes. So lastly, what were some of the things, not surprisingly, people wanted from a social worker to feel understood? That they had some sense of compassion and um, and openness. So I think I will leave that there um, and come out of my presentation. Shall I come out of this, Tracy? That is that the best. Yeah, thing yeah I think that would be yeah. good. Thank you, okay. Alice. I mean, that's been absolutely fascinating as expected. And I do want to just direct you in due course to have a look at the chat because there are some really nice comments in there too. I think with the chat, there's been a little bit of confusion because sometimes the chat can go to everybody. Sometimes it's just going to the panelists. So, oh. um, so yes, um, I think that's been a little bit of a, um, so we might be replying to everybody based on things that have just been sent to us. So apologies for any confusion on that. There have been a couple of questions for you, Alice, though. 
And right. I'll present those that have come to us in chat. The first one we had is, didn't you feel that your interviews could actually be interventions in themselves? That during an incredibly stressful time in their lives, it might feel a positive experience to have somebody who was just listening to them without judging that they could speak freely without fear or repercussions. Yeah, what a lovely question. And yes, I did feel that. I felt really privileged to actually have that opportunity to be there, not with a social work hat on, but just simply being there to give them that space. And I think it really, one of my key themes was about those people that did did well they had that sense of acceptance they'd accepted what had happened and I think even that interview those interviews gave them a chance to talk things through and, and reflect and and get into that mindset and equally for those that weren't successful they were stuck in this place of denial so I think it, it definitely opened up this idea to giving people that space and it, it not not happening because ideally that could be happening maybe with a therapist but we know that that's you know limited um limited resource something that just came to mind with that question as well is that one of my participants i asked her when we're talking about the presence of an angel in the nursery so someone who was able to offer you kind of comfort and protection in amongst the chaos but equally could they think of anyone now as an adult who they saw as a kind of supportive someone that wants to understand them kind of figure and the girl the parent I interviewed mentioned the therapist and she said me she said it might sound crazy but I'd say you know, in my interactions with you I have kind of felt that so that was lovely um that that didn't feel like I'd overstepped the boundary it felt like that was part of the process of of engaging with her so yeah that meant quite a lot brilliant thank you I do want to just get to another question. I think is very, another really interesting one is how can we as social workers or child protection professionals be child centered as well as fully serve some parents who are not obviously prioritizing their child's safety and well-being due to the minimizing concerns? Yes. So I think how how we be uh, child centered, but also focusing on the parents needs within that is probably within that process of what intervention looks like. So I think we are benefiting the parent and the child if we're doing pieces of work with them, which focus on things like mentalization. So in that instance, I think that parent is probably struggling to see whatever that safety risk is, they're struggling to see it from their child's perspective. So the work that needs to be done is about trying to improve the, the parent's capacity to connect with um, you know, what that child is thinking and, and feeling and whatever that safety scenario is. So I, I think that's where it feels it, you can add in the parent focus because you're trying to in, in the mode of intervention which is to try and help to improve things but the, the child is kind of at the center of that but you're also focusing on in, um, on that parent and that um, that need to, to have support in that specific area so you are supporting them and obviously this capacity to mentalize is going to benefit that parent in other settings as well not just with their child but yeah I think it's that that method of intervention and, and, and providing it you know not just simply coming into a family's life and making a list of all of the things that we want them to do differently but really having the space and the time and I know the resources to to really give them everything that we can to help facilitate that change that's the sort of parent focus bit I think and it's it's I mean uh, from the social work perspective in particular as well there is always that social work dichotomy between care and control which that question is it really a dichotomy or is they or are they one in the same in, in, in sort of a, a stretch sense. Um, I've got, uh, there's a couple of chats that have come in, but I'll ask you one other question here that I've got. Quite a few social workers, child protection workers, might not feel qualified to talk to parents about their attachment trauma. What do you suggest or advise? Yeah, so that one comes up quite a lot in, um, in my teaching, and we delve into this attachment trauma and um, the dynamics between that and the impact on parenting a bit more in our in our masters so it comes up then often with professionals thinking about it but 
I think my answer is always the same, which is the more learning and teaching that you, you have around that, you can see how critical attachment trauma is in kind of a piece of the puzzle of working out why a child is, uh, why a parent might be struggling or parenting in the way that they are. So it's something that we have to, as social workers, be acknowledging and exploring. Um, you know, it's part of the role of understanding the why and what needs to happen. Um, but I can completely understand why some people might have, have some apprehension about not feeling they're not a trained therapist, they're not a trained psychologist. But I think the foundations there of discussing some of these things are key for two reasons. One is that's also doing the bit of trying to understand, helping them feel that you're trying to understand them. You're building that epistemic trust. I want to hear about your experiences. I want to hear about um, about what's gone on for you so that I can understand you better. Um, so I think we have to do that bit. And then it might be from there on that we actually realise that a full you know, assessment by a psychologist or a therapist needs to take place. But it is within our remit and our role to gather that information. Um, and I think there's also an element of confidence and, and feeling comfortable with that because we are trained to have really difficult conversations. We are trained to manage emotion. We are trained to um to, to provide containment in stressful difficult situations so all those skills are actually there anyway and being done probably day to day so it's bringing that into into those conversations and into those discussions but i think it comes with with time and and gaining kind of confidence with that but it's definitely something that you know, people have this fear of opening up pandora's box but the box has got to be open you know it's such a key, key piece of that puzzle of, of understanding the risk and the situation and um and and why someone might be parenting in the way that they are i'm aware we've got one minute till the end but we've had two other really good questions come in so we will keep recording but if for those of you who have done this as an early morning break and you've got to get back to work go uh, we won't take any more questions after this but i do want to just present you with these last two questions if that's okay alice yeah one of them's a big one, so bear with me while Ooh. I read through it. It's good, okay. it's a big one. Okay. So how do we deliver double standards of perfect practice sort of when we, child protection social workers, were posed with having to deal with parents who feel you were their social workers by presenting their own problems rather than their immediate child's welfare? For example, concerned on how their children were removed from them previously because of this and that, and not focusing on the current and immediate concerns of their children still in their care. Do you think such parents will always say you have empath empathy with them if you're more focused to the current concern? Oh, that's a, there's a lot in there. Right. So um, I think I think giving them the space and the time to discuss and reflect and talk about those previous um, previous removals is so important. And I don't think it really happens enough uh, because, as I said, part of a change facilitator is so something that's going to give people a better chance to make any changes you're asking of them is for them to get psychologically into a place of acceptance. So I think that's 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 some work to be done in itself of exploring that past history, exploring in a very kind of open, non-judgmental way about what happened and what went on and hearing that and giving them an opportunity to reflect on that, to then use those reflections in a positive way to think about what the current situation is now. And if they were having, for example, parent infant psychotherapy, that's exactly what they would do. They would they would need to have that space um, to talk about it. So I think it's um, it also lends itself to I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to understand that previous history. Um, what was the bit about the last bit of the question about empathy? And then there was another set, the end of it. It's about whether you think parents believe you're empathizing with him if you're more focused on the current concerns versus thinking about those past experiences yeah so I think it's like I'm going to give this some space I'm going to give this maybe a session or even two sessions if I'm not imminently needing to do other things so that I um, can demonstrate that and remember 
if I've if I've started that bit in our relationship, if I'm creating that feeling, then you're in a much better place to think about the present. You know, what, OK, mm -hmm. so now that I felt I've given you that 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 sense of I'm trying to understand this, you're going to be in a better place to hear me when I talk about now. What are our worries with these children? Um, so the last question, and because we've run out of time, Alice, I'm going to ask you to try and answer it. This is a challenge in like a sentence or two so that we oh, can. Oh, no, it's impossible, up. probably. OK, so do you think that the criticism social workers face from the media in cases of child death is pushing social worker away from a more empathic approach because the perception is that in cases where children have poor outcomes, this is because the parents have not been challenged enough. Um, such a tough a difficult one to answer question. briefly. Pardon? That's a tough one to answer briefly. Yeah, that yeah, that's that's near impossible to answer briefly. Um, okay, can you ask me it again so I can compose a shorter answer? Okay. Do you think that the criticism social workers face in the media in cases of child death is pushing social work away from a more empathic approach? Because the perception is that we're not challenging them enough. Yes, I think it's creating an environment of fear on both sides. So more fear from the parent, more fear from the social worker. And I think that breeds a very authoritative a, a kind of self-protection, self-mechanism, authoritative way of being, um, which actually compromises the bigger picture of the relationship, which actually leads to more risk. Brilliant. Thank you, Alice. Again, please look at chat. There's some really lovely comments. I think your presentation has been really well received. It's something we really need to understand from a parent's perspective, how we can engage with those, those families we're working with. So it's been a hugely valuable experience. Thank you. Um, and for those who are still with us, thank you for hanging on till the end. And hopefully we'll see you at the next Critical Conversations in Child Protection webinar. The links are in the chat. I know I've put them and I think Aravind has put them in there as well. So hopefully we'll see you then. And thanks again, Alice. And thanks for your questions, everyone.